see what happens. Teddy, it has nothing to do with your yeah. offering to send the Italian model from the church. Well, yeah, I sent my own yeah, money over to Vince Brocade. Get on the little rolling <laughs> thing and get your ass over here. <laughs> okay, so I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce Regina. And this is uh, thank you, Ben Chelfin and Fish to You LLC for sponsoring Regina. And, uh, Ted told me I should said that Regina taught me everything I know, and she's the most fantastic woman in the world. But, but uh, no, I met Regina uh, about 16, 17 years ago. She was a customer of mine at the store, and um, I knew she had a lot of interest in the fish, and I was interested in her, so it, it kind of made sense that uh, we got together. Um, I wouldn't be where I'm at now if it wasn't for Regina. She keeps me in check with everything. Um, so uh, she breeds a lot of fish. She's dedicated to what she does. She's willing to try anything. Um, she's pretty fantastic. So uh, she's going to tell you a little bit about Tetras. She, she, she dabbles in everything, but uh, the talk again today is on uh, Tetras, some of the difficult fish you work with. And, uh, and uh, I'll let her have at it. Thank you, dear. I appreciate that. And thank you all for the invitation to be here. Uh, Eric and I have attended this event a couple of times, and I think that I can speak for both of us when I say that we always have a marvelous time. You guys have the greatest group of people here. Everyone's so friendly, and you share so much information with one another so freely, and it's always a great time to be here. For me, it's an honor to be able to share my program with you. My program is on Tetris. Um, a lot of people that I talk to don't keep Tetris, and I can't fathom why not. So my goal here today is to hopefully encourage you or get you out of a rut and expand your horizons a little bit and try to keep something that's a little bit different. So why not? They come in any shape, any size, and any color that you can possibly imagine. Some of them even have an attitude. There are some that guard their Crime. There are some that guard a territory. There are a lot of them that will guard a nest. And they will aggressively chase another fish out of their territory. So they're almost like a cichlid. So if you're interested in cichlid, some of the cichlids, some of the tethers that you can keep do actually have nasty little attitudes. Some of them are a challenge to breed. Most of the fish that we get from the Far East that are mass produced commercially. They're relatively straightforward. I don't like to say anything is easy to breed. I said that once and I offended a whole group of people. <laughs> so they're relatively straightforward to breed. Uh, they may not be the easiest, but they are, some of them are quite challenging. And almost all of the fry are a challenge to feed because they're so tiny. Many of the tetra species that I'm going to share with you in this program today, their fry look like slivers of glass. And if you're looking at them on a clear background or a piece of glass on a two and a half gallon tank, they're very, very difficult to see. And it gets even worse the older you get because your eyes don't work. So if you don't need a little bit of more encouragement, hopefully I can encourage you to try at least one species. And at the end of the program, I want to share something with you that I think is very relevant to our hobby. So here are just a handful of the fish that we caught while we were on a trip to Peru. They're all different and they're all very colorful. And if you will notice something about these fish, these are fresh out of the water, stream, river, lake, whatever. None of them are damaged. When we get fish in from importers, a lot of the times their fins are shredded or they don't have any, scales are missing, eyes are missing, and that's due to the stresses of shipping, the great distances that they have to travel. These guys, fresh out of the water, there's not a blemish on them. None of the fins are ripped, they all have their eyes. But if you put them in a bag and ship them, even an hour or two down the road when we took them home to the facility that we were staying at, they beat the crap out of one another. So a lot of these species don't make it into our hobby because it would be just so much work to bag them up individually and then ship them home. It's just, it's too much labor and I'm not gonna pay anybody to do that. So try a tetra. Um, 
I want to discuss with you how to select suitable fish. I want to show you gender differences. A lot of tetras, it's very difficult to tell the sexes. You might walk into a fish shop and see a whole slew, a whole um, herd of fishes, and you don't know how to tell a male from a female, but you're interested in taking them home. If you're interested in breeding the species, obviously you need a pair. I want to talk about the tank setups, the food, the water, spawning methods, spawning mediums, and fry foods. Fry foods are very, very important because these things have extremely small mouths. Sometimes they don't even have mouths when they're first hatched. First, I want to discuss tetra and kerosene. They're, they're, they're two of the same things, but they're not. So there is a family of fish, the kerosens, of which they are tetras. But not every tetra is, uh, every tetra is a kerosene, but not every kerosene is a tetra. Some of the fish that I will show with you, share with you, excuse me, um, have been moved into their own families. So they're still tetras, but they're not. And piranhas. Some places say they're, they're a kerosene, and some places say that they're not. I'm not sure. So I don't know if they're still a kerosene. That's up to those people that uh, bend genomes. I don't know anything about that. Let's talk about selecting fish. Let's say you go into a fish shop and you see a fish that you really want to work with. Something catches your eye and you think, oh, I have to have that. You always want to make sure that you get healthy fish. If you see any fish, I don't care what the species is, a cichlid, a bar, a rasbora, I don't care what it is, you want to ensure the fish looks healthy. No emaciated fish, so if they have a hollow belly or a sunken belly, no bent spines. If they're missing eyes, they're missing fins, don't buy them. That's just a complete waste of money, and it's an even worse waste of time. I made a mistake of buying a group of tetras online, sight unseen, and I got them home, and um, there was a head, there was a slender silver body, and there was a tail. And it was from a very reputable, very reputable um, importer. I'll never make that mistake again, but they were really neat fish that I heard they ever get to see, so I bought them. And I, well, I bought six, and I wound up with three. So be careful. You want to do a lot of research. If it's a species that you're not familiar with, and this goes with anything that you want to buy. I don't care if it's a pleco or what it is. Do some research. If you're not familiar with it, please do research. Everybody likes to be on those handy gadgets, have our faces in our phones. Take five minutes away from social media and do some research. It will pay off in the long run. It will make you a much better um, fish keeper. So we want to talk about the water chemistry, diet compatibility. Check to see if your intentions are to breed. Check to see if you're better off flock spawning, meaning there's more than three fish in a tank, and or if you want to spawn them as pairs. Some will do great as pairs, some will do terrible. So you'll need to do a little bit of research. A lot of the newer tetras that are coming out that are quite expensive but worth every penny, um, there isn't a lot of information out there. So if you can't find the information, splurge, take a plunge, give it a shot. It's not going to hurt anything. So you want to always purchase from a reputable breeder or a reputable retailer. <coughs> Again, if you go online, there's a lot of people online that want to sell you fish. If you see somebody selling uh, six really rare tetras or a tetra that you never heard of before, number one, research that species. They might be using an old um, synonym, an old name, and you try to fool you into getting your money when it's just a common tetra. So do a little bit of research. It can't hurt you, it can only help you. You also want to make sure you buy from a good breeder. A lot of people, I can throw any kind of fish in water and they'll breed, and if I sell you fish that are just crap, what are you getting? You're getting a headache and I just filched your wallet. You don't want that to happen. So be careful with what you buy and who you buy from. Sexing tetras. Again, this can be quite challenging. Since tetras come in any size, there are some that are extremely small, that are great for planted tanks, great for nano tanks, and some are a little bit larger. They still do great in a planted tank. You gotta be careful though, because some of them will nibble on plants. So if you have valuable plants, research, again, the species. For almost every tetra that's out there, the female is always going to be heavier bodied. Usually the females are smaller than the males, with a few exceptions, some of them are larger. And the males will almost always be more colorful. They'll almost always be um, more elaborate with their fins. 
this dramatic display of fins is how they attract females. So if anybody's got the long flowing fins, the females will eye them up and say, hey, yeah, I want to spawn with you. An easy way that I found anyway to check to see if I've got males and females is to just put them in a clear container and look down on them from above. Most tethers are extremely skittish fish, so they'll dash around and move around quite a bit. But as you can see, I hope I do this right. So as you can see, right behind the operculum, the female's body begins to get wider, even in young fish. They're always going to be thicker. Right behind the pep, the uh, operculum, the gill covers, they'll be a lot wider. And the males will always be streamlined, unless they've gobbled up a whole bunch of food and they're all bloated. It's still pretty um, evident because the females, the whole way back, she's wider than the male. And these are cardinal tetras, and cardinal tetras can, if you get them in a store, usually they have young fish, they can be a little bit problematic at that age, a young age, to sex. So if you put them, ask them, um, the store personnel to put them in the container for you, they will, and you can determine whether they have males and females in the tank, because I did make a mistake in my tent and they were all female. Tank setups. Um, if your intentions are to breed, then you really have to pay attention to this. I try to keep everything as minimal. There's no substrate in a tank that I want to spawn tetras in. I want to be able to see those eggs and I want to be able to see any potential fry. So I always keep the tank bottom bare. You always have to have either borrow water or a mixture of borrow water and filtered tap water or treated tap water. I have the luxury of being at home 24 seven. So if I use straight RO water in my tanks, I can monitor that water. If you are going to work and you're going from home 12 hours, eight hours, 16 hours, whatever, I would avoid using straight RO water because that pH can change, crash, and melt those fish. And they literally do melt. Um, a lot of the times also they'll get a cloudy eye or they'll get a sloughing of the skin. Please don't run out and buy chemical warfare and start dumping it into your tank do a water change before you do anything. Unless you actually recognize it, velvet, or any other parasite, don't use chemical warfare. Do a water change first. So most species that are farm raised, I said it before, they really don't require special waters because they, they, they don't know where they came from. Those fish don't know if it's Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, they don't know where they came from. They, they only know that they grew up in this water, this is the water they're gonna spawn in. If you're ever not sure, do some research. If you're not 100% not sure, just grab some fish and take them home and give them a try. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You can throw them in a planet tank, you can throw them in a local club auction, whatever, if you're, if you're not happy with them. Just give them a try. You always have to use aeration. These guys don't like to be in stagnant water. They may be in slow moving water in the wild, but stagnant water is a no-no. You're just gonna create a fill more time in the water, there's gonna be a lack of oxygen, and the fish are gonna be belly up. High quality foods. Live food is always preferable. Uh, frozen food, high quality frozen food, uh, uh, good flake food, good pellet food. Keep in mind though that 99% of the tetras that we feed, they're not gonna go onto the bottom to eat. Once that stuff falls halfway past their nose, they're done. They're not gonna go and search up. Even if it's moving, they're not gonna go and search up. Um, your choice is spawning medium. Do you wanna use a nylon mop? Do you want to use um, plastic netting? Do you wanna create a grate over the bottom of the tank so the eggs fall through and the parrots can't get at them? Or do you wanna just be lazy like me and just use job moss, weighted down with a stone or two? I just do it the easy way because Tetras are a good fish to work with if you're a relaxed fish keeper or a relaxed fish breeder because you don't need to do a lot up to them other than the water changes and feed the, adult, the adults heavily. Once they, they lay eggs, you can take a break for about a month. So keep it simple. <coughs> Excuse me. This is uh, Capella vitata. We brought these back from Peru. This is a really pretty little species. I hardly ever see it available online, 
but the males have more, they have larger fins and their fins are more colorful and the females are rounder. Um, they spawn underneath of leaves, so you can use Anubias, um, anything with a wide, stiff leaf you can use. These guys, for whatever reason, some of the males decide to lure the females onto stones, flat stones, and they deposit their eggs there. These guys have an attitude. They keep everybody away from their eggs. I don't care who's in the tank with them, they could be bigger fish than they are, they'll drive that fish away because don't touch my eggs. So that's a really neat fish. But you see I have no substrate, just a sponge filter, and some plants and some rocks. Whatever food I feed them, if it falls to the bottom, at the end of the day, I siphon that out and re-add water. These guys need a lot of RO water, so if you want to do like 90% RO and 10% uh, treated talc, that's fine with them. Uh, really easy to spawn. <gasps> I said the easy one. Anyway, fry food. Before I get into fry food, I forgot to put a slide in here. When you're spawning the tetras, or a reservoir, or, or I don't care what it is, you have the object of deciding whether you're going to remove the parrots after they spawn, or are you going to remove the media. You can do either one. The bad thing about removing the parrots is if you have a lot of plant cover, you're going to stir that up because the tetras are really, really quick. If you remove the medium, you're going to lose some eggs and you're going to lose some fry. So it's entirely up to you. I remove the medium if I'm out of space. If not, I just remove the parents and move them in with somebody else. I always separate my males and females and condition them separately. And I do just like the textbook says, put the female in and then put the male in the next day and then they spawn and then I remove the um, parents. So fry foods. The first thing that I want you to do if you have a uh, tetra that spawns is to lower the aeration in the tank. If you have that bubbling away, it's just like throwing the little tetra fry into your washing machine. They cannot combat the aeration heavy. It has to be a low aeration. Just make the bubbles air. If you're using a canister filter or if you're using um, a hang-on filter, just make it really gentle. Just break the surface tension. You don't need a lot of bubbles up there. Tetra fry, most of the time, they're going to go to the surface to eat. So you want that tension in the water to be broken just gently. Don't boil them, they're, they're going to die. So add live plants, lazy way, cheap way, whatever, easy way. Um, there's a ton of microfauna on all living plants, whether it's in the water or out of the water. Um, the fry will go to that and they will pick at it. It's also good for shelter. They need to feel secure in their environment. You don't want to just throw those tiny little fry in this bare tank with nothing in there except a sponge filter or some other sort of filter source because they're going to look for somewhere to hide. So don't throw them into a bare tank. Throw some plants in there. If not for food, then at least for cover. And sponge filter dirt. It doesn't matter which tank you take the sponge filter out of. I use any of them and I've never had a problem. Take this, remove the sponge filter, or even if you're using a cartridge filter, if you have a canister filter, you can use a turkey baster and siphon off some of the debris at the bottom. Don't bother filtering that. Just squirt it into a container, make sure it's the same temperature as the fried water is, and then just pour it in slowly. All that is in there, it's, it's just tons of bugs that are in there, and critters that are in there, and those fish will eat whatever's in there, and they will root around in there to get it. And most of it stays suspended anyway. So infusoria, <coughs> excuse me, infusoria, there's a ton of recipes online. Just punch it in. People use dried up turnips, they use dried up lettuce leaves, grass clippings, hay, whatever, banana peel. Get some aquarium water, put it in a glass jar, and I cannot stress this enough, plastic is doom. Don't use plastic, it has to be glass. So if you have a glass container, fill it up halfway with aquarium water. Just make sure it's the same. It's not hard water. We don't want hard water. Fill it up. There's already a lot of bugs and bacteria that are in that water that those fry will eat. Put whatever medium you're going to cook inside of there and set it in a bright window, not a sunny window, a bright window. And in about a week, you should see little swirls of animals in there, and that's what the fry will eat. 
Incidentally, you want to prepare your food before you <coughs> go on your fry. You want to make sure you have all your foods in line before you have fry. It's going to do you no good to spawn a tetra and then have nothing to feed it. So get that ready first. Green water, again, glass jar, water, sunny window sill, it'll turn green. There's all kind of microfauna growing in there. The easy way to do it, for me anyway, if you have your fry in the tank, take something dark and cover the top of the tank. Make sure the sides are covered also. My tanks are job jammed in next to one another so there's no light coming in. But make sure that it's dark. Leave an area about two inches at the back of the tank so that light penetrates the water. Infusoria will gather in that light spot and all of the fry will go there and eat. So it's a cheap and easy way to ensure that your fish has something to eat your fry. Excuse me. This is Hasmania nanofry. It's hours old. Uh, you'll notice, I hope, the tiny little baby brown shrimp. There's no way that fry is eating that shrimp. It will go for that shrimp, never going to eat it. So be careful. Look at what you have. If you throw a brine shrimp in there and that brine shrimp just settles out and dies, you're, gonna, you're not really going to follow the water, I don't think. But you could cause a hydro problem. You get hydro, your fry are pretty much doomed. They're just going to be dead. So be careful. These guys don't need to be fed bigger foods until they're a few weeks to a month old. You have to watch whichever fry you have. Not all tetra fry come out the same size. And I'll show you most of the species in here that have larger fry, and most of them, they're really tiny. So feeding the water, feeding the fish and water changes. You don't really need to feed your tetra fry, I've never anyway, depending on species, for at least two weeks. These things are tiny. Like I said, a sliver of glass, they actually look like a sliver of glass if you ever look at them. So you want to check on them. When they first hatch out, they automatically stick to the sides of the tank, or they stick to plants. They'll stick to anything. They would land on the top of their head and they just stick. And they don't move, and that's to avoid predation. That's why most of them are clear. They just blend in with whatever background they're on. So if you're frying after, usually after the first week, I start to give them green water, the sponge scrunch, whatever. You can also, if there are still eggs, add the sponge uh, squeezings or the um, green water. It's not going to damage the eggs. It's in my experience anyway that it doesn't damage the eggs. So after they get a little bit of size, you want to start adding more foods. Uh, powdered foods, microworms, maybe brine worms. But you have to ensure that that fry's mouth is large enough to eat these foods. Don't be too quick at first. Add a little bit of a time. If you see that they're eating, their bellies are full, then you can pretty much feed the whole entire tank as heavy as you want, so long as you maintain those water changes. The more you feed, the more you have to do the water changes. <coughs> you need the water changes to keep that water clean and to induce those fry to grow. They're not going to grow very well in stagnant, foul water. So water changes. A week after the fry hatch, I start scooping out a cup of water, like a deli cup of water, put a deli cup of water back in, and I always use water from the parents' tank. <coughs> if you have the luxury of having, say, a 10-gallon tank empty, with a sponge filter and some plants in there to maintain the biological system, you can use water from the spare tank. Until they're about a month old, and then I start increasing the amount of water out in. <coughs> Gradually, I start acclimating them to regular tap water, filtered tap water, switching them over from RO to regular tap water, so it saves you a lot of time and labor and your valuable RO water. And that's a process that is lengthy and slowly done. By the time they're a month, month and a half old, I take a cup of filter tap water and put that into whatever water I'm going to add back into the tank. And I just gradually increase the amount of tap water that I replace water with. So it's a little bit of a process. I want to talk about some South American species. Um, we've been collecting fish in South America for, gosh, decades. There are so many different tetra species in, in South America throughout 
the whole entire continent. And there are species down there that we're still, dis we're still discovering. I want to start off with two species that you can, what I call, cut your teeth on. If you've never toyed with a tetra, these would be two species that I would recommend trying. There are many, many other species that you can try to just dabble in to see if you would really be interested in increasing your knowledge and your faith in yourself. Um, Hyphus on Amanda, this is a gem of a fish. It's less than an inch, beautiful gl glowing colors. Um, easy to tell males and females. Females are always heavier, plumper. The males are always streamlined. Perfect in a nano tank, even though I'm not an advocate of those. Uh, perfect in a nano tank, plant a tank. To breed them is extremely simple. You feed them, put them in water, they spawn in whatever weeds you have growing in the tank. They will, any tetra, fry. Well, not <coughs> tetra species, excuse me. Any tetra, within a few species that won't, eat their eggs and eat their fry. So you have to monitor, if you set something up to spawn, you better be ready to look in the tank. If you want to have any quantity of fish, you want to look in the tank to make sure you have fry and get the parents out of there. The numbers that are up here, uh, temperature-wise, this is what I found recommended on nearly every website I looked on. I never keep my fish unless there's something that specifically requires it, like discus, anywhere over 80 degrees. I don't want to cook my fish, and I really don't want to increase that age process. I don't want the I don't want them to die within a year. pH is pretty simple. Um, the hardness of the water, ours is usually anywhere between 150 and 2, 2 202, something like that. They seem to be pretty tolerable to water chemistry. Um, but again, it's because they're probably, I don't know for a fact, but they're probably mass produced somewhere. Life foods to condition, um, that's with every fish if you're trying to spawn something. If it's not, not going to be a live food, at least that would be a good quality flake food or a really good uh, quality frozen food. Has a mania nana, uh, silver tip tetra. Some people call it a white tip tetra. This is a really sweet fish also, maybe an inch, usually less, uh, usually farm raised. These are really pretty fish in the planet tank. Nothing beats gold against green. So this fish species, these guys are feisty. They'll even bother, not severely, they don't cause any damage, but they'll bother other species their, their own size. So be careful with them, because they can be a little bit uh, feisty, not really damage anybody, but they can scare fish away from eating, so be careful with them. Again, we have the temperatures, the pH. Mine spawned in 7.2, and I was able to raise the fry, so I don't really think the temperature's really that important with these guys. They're another one, they're not gonna eat uh, food from the bottom of the tank. So I, these are simple to keep, even if you're not going to spawn them, if you put them in a planted tank, or just put them in a plant in a tank and watch them. They're, they're interesting to watch, they're quite entertaining. I have a super icon on Alakis. this is a tiny fish. Um, they also call them the reed tetra. They also resemble Aphiocarex uh, paraguayensis. The paraguayensis have a long, slender body. They don't have the elaborate fins that the alacus do. This is a sweet fish. They spawn every day. It's a smaller fish, so the, the eggs that they release is usually a small amount, anywhere from 10 to maybe 12 eggs at a time. But every day they'll be frying eggs, frying eggs, frying and frying eggs. I remove these, the, um, spawning medium. I now you just use java moss. I just use a big net, closely woven so there's hardly any holes in it, and I just reach behind it, scoop it out, and remove it into a container with water from the parent's tank, the fry hatch out, and I just proceed from there. The females do not have the elaborate fins that the males do, and they're also a deeper body fish, a fuller body fish. And they do not like a lot of current in the water, so you might want to keep their current down to a minimum. And here's a fry. Just popped out, a little bit over three millimeters. Here on macro, you can see the flex that are on the body, but when you look in the tank, all you see is a little silver thing bobbling along the bottom. When you siphon that guy out, speaking of spice siphoning, 
If anybody has any kind of fry that they want to photograph, there's a gentleman in the room that's selling small, maybe, I don't know, five, six inch long um, basters, thank you. Basters are they're a buck a piece, and they're perfect for taking any kind of detritus out of your tank if you want to photograph something, or for taking fry and eggs out of something. They're, it's the perfect size. You can get them to tight spaces, so it's really wonderful. So. If you want to do anything unusual with them, I'd suggest um, hitting that guy up. So there's the fry. And I wish I could have blew it up larger, because I put them under a microscope. There's no mouth. I don't know when his mouth shows up, or it opens, or whatever, but I couldn't see a mouth. And I was making him turn over by squirting with air out of a baster. He doesn't have a mouth. So I don't know what he does. He must hang out for a couple of days, and then decide, oh, I need to eat. And they get a mouth, but anyway. They don't have a mouse, you don't have to feed them for a couple of days. Which I think is pretty great because if you're relaxed and you're not spending a lot of time on your tank, it's a perfect fish for you. This is another fish that's hot uh, this time of the <laughs> this time of our life. Um, I have to break on water, I'm the very tetra. Everybody wants this fish. This fish is very expensive. If you go to buy it online, it's a lot of money. But you know what? It's worth every penny. <laughs> and I don't mean that to be demeaning. If you can't afford to buy a fish like this, then it's not, it's not a problem. You can always buy like a Kirai Tetra or something like that that resembles that. These guys are really feisty. Put them in a tank. I don't care how big it is. They will chase the crap out of each other. If you try to flock spawn them, you can't have any more than five fish in a tank down tank because all they do is chase each other. There's no spawning going on. They're just chasing one another. So straightforward, feed them well, do a couple of water changes, mostly RO, some filtered tap. You'll get eggs. The fry will hatch out and the fry are white. When I photograph them, when I drag them out of the tank, the fry are always white. They look like little cotton balls bobbling around on the bottom of the tank. Um, it's a beautiful fish. The photograph, nobody's photograph can do this fish justice. justice. You have to look at it in real life, don't you Mark? Yep, in the morning. Yeah, they just look like they're glowing. They're just beautiful fish. Spicy, but they're really nice. My females are bigger than my males, just by a smidge. The males are, again, streamlined. The females are heavier quality. They'll eat anything I put in the tank, so long as it doesn't go below the mid midline of the water column. They won't follow anything down, even if it's moving. Hyphosobrycon heliacus, the kitty tetra. This is a fish I haven't seen around, but then I don't look for a, a lot of fish anymore because we've been a little bit busy lately. This is a fish from Brazil. Again, the photograph really doesn't do them justice. They're just stunning fish. They're both colorful. Both sexes are very colorful. The males have the elaborate um, dorsal fins. Can't really see it on there, but to, is Tony for Sarah in here? No. Good, because he'd be cringing about the photographs that I have. Um, they all have the humeral spots. I call them slashes because they're not really spots. But the whole entire fish, these fins, they actually look like they're on fire. They're glowing. It's beautiful fish. They're feisty also, but they don't cause damage to anything. They'll chase one another, but they don't bite each other. So it's a really sweet fish. If you can get your hands on them, you might see them in the store offered. They're just going to be silver washed out fish. Don't be afraid to buy a silver fish. If you take a silver fish home, put it in good water, quality food, you'll be surprised at how that will become <coughs> not the ugly duckling, but the beautiful swan. So take a chance and buy something like that. My favorite group is this. I'm sorry? Did you breed those the same way with just Java moss? Yes. I have read my tanks. Oh, no, I put them Java moss, just a clump of Java moss. I weighed it down with a couple of rocks, and they just go to town in there, and then I remove them. I can, you can remove the parrots also, but I'm not the best fish catcher. So when I'm in there <laughs> flailing around trying to catch the fish, the plants are flying everywhere, and that's not, not good. Splash tetras are my favorite. I happen to like fish that nobody else likes. I like the underdog fish. I like the ones that nobody wants to be bothered with, which is mostly silver fish and uh, brown fish. So, splash tetras have been moved 
the order, but they have their own um, family now. They're still, to me, a tetra, but technically, I guess they're not. This is Capella Arnold died. This is the uh, splash tetra, the real splash tetra. Spawns out of the water. Males have the elaborate fins, lots of color. This back, tail part, collar part, whatever. Um, really long and flowing. All of the fins on the males are very, very colorful and they flow just like little gowns. It's a slender fish, it's a small fish, it's beautiful in a planted tank. See the, the uh, pH? They'll live 7 to 7.7, but they're not going to breed there. They have to have a lower pH. And they're not going to live forever in a higher pH either. And they will tend to, their colors tend to fade out. They, they just don't look good. So this is the fish that, uh, this is the fish that leaves the water. The male will display in front of a female and dance for her, display all of his fins, make himself look sexy and handsome, and then the female will come up next to him. He actually wraps those fins around her, and they both turn upside down, they leave the water. They leave the water turned upside down, and they attach themselves to, to glass, or usually in nature, it's a leaf, obviously. They deposit the eggs, and it take them a couple of seconds, they'll hang there, and then they both plunk back down. And they'll repeat the process over and over and over again until the female is depleted. And then he will hang beneath that nest and just flick his tail, flick water up onto the eggs to keep them moist. It's so entertaining to watch. If you have the opportunity to keep this fish, just for something different than YouTube to look at, I encourage you to do so. It's a beautiful, magnificent animal uh, and really entertaining to watch. The only bad thing is once those eggs hatch, the fry hanging up, Couple of seconds, plop down in the water, their, their lunch, breakfast, dinner, whatever time it is. They get eaten. But if you have, if you, how acidic and soft does it have to be to have to breathe? Mine spawned at uh, 5.8. 5 .8. Yeah, and I think my TBS was 198, which isn't good, but they still did it. Um, I fed them with a lot of mosquito larvae. Don't tell Eric Bondrock that I actually had fruit fly larvae or fruit flies in my house, no. and I fed him fruit flies also. He hates when I bring fruit flies home. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, to do this at home, just use the vehicle. I'm sorry. I was going to say, have you tried to do anything to hatch them artificially? Yeah. yeah. I remove the glass lid, and what I do is I either put it over a two and a half gallon tank, again, they have water from the parents' tank is in the um, two and a half gallon tank, or you can use a shoe box, a little plastic <coughs> container. I don't like to keep them, I keep a lot of my fish in uh, fry in cool containers, but that water has the tendency to just foul just like that. If I'm not right on that, then I wipe out fry. So the larger the container of water, obviously the more, the lengthier time it's going to be stable. But yeah, just put that, set it okay. over the glass, just over the water. Um, you don't even have to do anything. If you want to ensure that the eggs stay moist, just put a piece of saran wrap, an old shower cap over the tank, and then it will stay moist. Or you can put the sponge filter up. You can actually watch them develop. They usually hatch out within 24 to 48 hours, depending on temperature. That sponge filter is going to splash water up on them, just like the parent or the daddy would. And then they fall down, you lower the uh, aeration, and you're set to go. They're really straightforward to raise, too. They're not very problematic. It's a really cool fish. If any of the splash catchers that I would encourage you to try would be them, just for the show. It's, it's really cool. Capella Agamoni, I brought some of these for the um, silent auction. Again, here's another fish that you photograph it. The photograph doesn't do justice. The fish is just unbelievably gorgeous. This is the male. Lots of fins. The fins are almost always colorful. Sometimes if he gets stressed, that, that color seems to go away. The dark, chocolatey brown zigzag stripe, dark back. They have a dark back because they're surface dwellers. At the, the, the 
Sunlight hits the top of the water in nature. They blend in with that water. You can't tell that they're there unless they move. So they have a dark back. Whenever that fish is trying to seduce a female, that fish makes a complete turnaround for color. The fish actually looks like a carving made out of mother of pearl. It's unbelievable. All that brown's gone. Every speck of brown on that fish is gone. And he's just one solid, beautiful, radiant, ivory colored fish. And the, 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 the sunlight or the tank lights just turns that fish. It's just magnificent to see it. And he gets uh, red flecks on his, on his sides. They do not leave the water. They spawn under plant material or they'll spawn in a um, clump of java moss. The male guards the eggs and the male guards the fry. There'll be a whole clown of fry from, around him and he won't let anybody else near it. And those fry can stay in there indefinitely. I've harvested the fry from the tank and I'm not talking two or three, I'm talking like 20 and 30 fry from a tank that had the mom and the dad in it because the mom's up there in the corner hiding and daddy's hanging out making sure that nobody bothers the fry. It's a magnificent species and they're very straightforward. Straight RO water or a combination of mostly RO water and filter tap, you'll get fry. They're very prolific. And the fry pretty much take care of themselves if they're in there with daddy. They grow faster when they're in the tank with the parents. If you remove them, they're just as easy to spawn or to uh, rear. Green water, sponge scrunch, powdered food, microworms, baby brine. You just increase it as the, the size of the food as the fry size increases. Do you tend to keep the water level down a little bit in your tank keeping the capella or do you keep it hot? The um, arnold dye, I did. These guys, I don't because they don't leave the water. The arnold dye, <coughs> excuse me, the, th the water, that's a great question, thank you. The water level does have to be at least an inch, inch and a half below the, the glass or they're just, they just won't do anything. They seem to need to leap out of the water a little bit of a distance. <coughs> Thank you. So sometimes these are also sold as capella mite. The fish that I have um, were captured by Jeff Cardwell in an area near the, the Mite River in Colombia last year. You can take those fish that are in there and I guarantee you if you treat them right within a week you should have eggs and fry. So it's a really, really cool fish. So you can and colony breed those things. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can colony breed them. Excuse me, ma'am. Sorry. Yeah, you can colony breed these guys. And even if there's, I spawned them in a five and a half, and there were, I think, seven fish adults. The male, everybody else is on the outside. Everybody else is up against the glass, trying to hide from the male. But you can see the female, much deeper body. She still has some nice fins, but not nowhere near, <clears throat> excuse me, as nice as the males are. What about putting them outside? I don't put any of my fish outside. No? No. I mean, I suppose you can. I, I just, I don't do it where we're at right now. It's almost like National Geographic, and I don't want, we have a dog that has a high prey drive. I don't, I don't want to deal with that. So I don't do anything outside. I imagine you could, I don't see why you couldn't. You know, there's all kind of good critters would be landing in that water. They'd be having a feast and you know, hundreds of hundred, hundred fry. Especially they land back in the water there. Um, <laughs> yeah, you better hope. So could come out of the water. Yeah. Why? Helps. <laughs> Here's a photograph of the fry and the egg. So Clear egg, clear fry, some brown markings on the fry. And again, if that thing has a mouth, I sure as couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when I keep them, when I spawn them, I stop spawning them because they're extremely prolific. Um, they usually don't start eating anything until about the fourth or fifth day. Yes, Sally. I've noticed when the fry get their mouth, their eyes usually turn with a sh shiny. Okay. Reflective. Okay. When they're dark like that, they still in reality. Okay. Did everyone hear her? No. No? 
This is Sally Boggs. She's a past member of the Greater Pittsburgh Aquarium Society. She moved to Maine. She left us. Um, she has a PhD, so she knows what she's talking about. She spawned plenty of fish. She said that whenever the... Oh, here you do it. Give my voice a rest. Oh, my goodness. Come on. If you want to know when the fish can eat, look and see if the eyes are reflected. When they're black like this and aren't reflecting light, uh, they're just not usually yet mature. The fish that breed in tubes, in caves, often you, that are hanging, you can look and see if the eyes are, because you want to catch them before the male leaves them to hatch. And the eye, the reflective eye works. Everyone get that? Thank you, Sally. So this is uh, this is what the fry looks like. They don't move. You can go in the, in the if they attach themselves, you go in there and root up the whole entire tank, and they're, they're just not going to move. So I take a flashlight and I look for them. Carolina Vitata, <coughs> excuse me, this is the fish I was in the tank setup uh, slide. This is a beautiful fish. If you see it in a store, which I doubt that you will, it's just a silver fish with some black dots on it. When you take that fish home again, silver fish, put it in some good water with some good food, lots of plants, that fish will turn your head when you look past and you walk past the tank. The male's fins are all colors. They'll be blue, they'll be white, they'll be orange, depending on his mood in it time of day. Their fins, um, I'm sorry, the scales will begin to look like they've been outlined in black or they have black dots all over them. It's just a stunning fish. This fish will guard the fry, or I'm sorry, the eggs. The fry are on their own once they hatch. But this is a nice small fish. Perfect for an anno tank, perfect for a planted tank. These guys will take food off of the bottom if it's moving. If it's not moving, they'll just look at it and keep right on swimming. Relatively straightforward to induce to spawn. Lots of good food, water changes, soft acidic water. Guarantee it within three days you'll have, you'll have eggs. And there's a photograph of a female. You can see she does not have the elaborate fins. Her colors are a little paler and she's obviously around her in the belly region. Pencil fish. <coughs> this is another group of fish I just particularly like. They're very interesting to watch. Most of them swim with their heads up in the air, almost like they're being snooty and sticking their nose up with everybody when they're swimming past. Um, the anostomus, any species of anostomus will gobble your plants up so they're not good for a planted tank. And they do tend to get a little larger and they, <coughs> they're quite nasty. The first one I want to start with is Equus or Equus, the hockey stick pencil fish. This is an old species that's been around for I don't know how many years. This you will find in pet shops. It's a beautiful fish. It is just brown and brown and brown and a little bit of cream color, but they're beautiful. They have a cryptic pattern at night as do all the pencil fishes where they develop red slash marks and their colors, their normal base colors diffuse a little bit. Um, you can tell, somebody got the right one here. The males from the females because all the males will always have a red anal fin. So if you go into a pet store, if you can't tell by body shape or size, try to look, get a flashlight, or everybody has a cell phone, cell phones all have flashlights on them now. Try to see if you can see, um, <coughs> if you can spot a red anal fin on the fish. And the females are always heavier body. These fish are really cool. They spawn up underneath of uh, large leaf plants, a good stiff, um, heavy relief plant, Anubias, would be a great one. Um, they lay relatively large eggs. They're amber colored. They're relatively easy to see the um, eggs. These guys prefer their, their food to be on the surface of the water. This is another fish that I induced to spawn by feeding it um, fruit fly. They'll also take uh, mosquito larvae. They'll take um, frozen foods and some pellet foods, once it drops past their nose, they're never going to go after it. So you either have to have something on the bottom of the tank vacuuming up their old food, 
or I should say the board fee, um, or just change the water. They require soft water, so you have to have, uh, I use straight RO for them. Um, gentle aeration, they like it a little bit warmer, so I have the tank, usually goes up to 80 degrees, if it goes any higher, I turn all the heat on. Um, they can't withstand uh, warmer water. So, when they spawn, you can actually either take the whole plant out of the tank, which to me makes them sort of convenient because you can remove their substrate quite easily. There is no substrate. It's on a plant. Just take the plant out and put it into either fresh or water or water from the parent's tank. Either one will work. The bad thing about these fry is you'll always miss a spawn. These guys actually look like floating pine needles. They look like detritus, and they don't swim. They just kind of like wander around in the water column. And then they attach themselves, they don't move. It's usually about four days before these guys eat. They just drift around and hang on something in the tank. Uh, they're very, 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 very touchy as to water changes. So their water changes, I use a baster. I squirt out a couple baster, turkey baster of water, and I have to squirt a little bit back in. It's, they're, they're very sensitive. Once you get them past that one, more, one month mark, they grow like little weeds. Do the parents uh, eat them much? The parents will eat the fry. They don't seem to eat the eggs. Okay. Will you feed the babies? These guys, when they first hatch out, it's usually four days later that I feed them and I start them off on green water and sponge crunch. And I don't have, there's not much aeration in the water. So what I do with these guys is I usually put um, another like a quarry species on the bottom that'll scurry corridors, fry on the bottom, they'll kick up the debris a little bit and it goes up into the water column. But these guys you have to stay on top of the amount of food that you give them. It's almost like, I feed them usually four or five times a day, but that's because I'm at home. I don't know how you would do that if you were at work for eight, 10, or 12 hours. But they do need a lot of food. And I like green water also because that stays up in the water column more. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tend to sink or settle out, except after when the lights go out. But once you get them past a couple couple weeks to a month, they're not a problem at all. Yes? Do you, you outside of green water, do you use rotifer? Um, I have frozen rotifers at home. I have never tried to cultivate. That would be another good thing if someone wanted to do research. If you want to challenge yourself with raising some live food, that's another good thing to try. Because really, any fry will eat rotifers, parodies. Oh, yeah, they'll be up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's another one I always have the back of the tank open so that the light can get into there and they'll feed. But they're almost like um, aimless fry. They really don't swim around looking for anything. They seem to drift. It's kind of weird. But very interesting. The Nostomus SBI, the barred pencil fish. This is another one. Um, the, the, the males and females are both marked the same. They have a little bit different finish. The males might be a little elaborate. I don't know, I wouldn't say elaborate, they're just a little bit larger. The colors on the males are brighter. But with a fish this color, there's really no other color to be enhanced on them. See the small mouths? Small foods. Mosquito, tiny mosquito larvae, daphnia, chopped up blood worms, black worms. You don't want to give them like these big uh, granules and throw them in the tank and they're another one. They're not going to eat off the bottom. Straightforward to breed, soft water, warm water, feed them really well, do a lot of water changes. If you do a lot of water changes, that induces the females to fill up with roe because they think it's the rainy season. And it's time for me to disperse my, my seed everywhere. So they're pretty straightforward. Same thing with the fry. Green water, sponge scrunch, uh, increase the sizes of the food as the fry increase in size. Odds and ends. Um, what do you, what do you, what's, what's morning the, the, For yeah. those guys? Yeah. I'm sorry. They'll spawn up under leaves also. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it's usually up underneath the leaves. Good question, and thanks for reminding me. 
This is one of my favorite fish on the whole entire planet, and I don't have favorites of anything. This is one of the coolest fish I've ever worked with. Uh, this is Cornipoma raceni. Here's the male, and thank God Tony Tercera is not here. This is a horrible picture because this male's fins are just huge. They're like drapes, they just flow in the water. They're just dynamic. They're silver fish. They might get a little bit of pink or blue, depending on what light hits, a little bit of purple sometimes, depending on which light hits them. The males inseminate the females. She doesn't eat him once those eggs are infertilized. She doesn't eat him anymore. He's done. You can go away and go on. Go your way and I'll go mine. She'll wander all through the tank, and if you've got a lot of plants in the tank, she'll just pop an egg here, swim along over there, pop an egg over there, and the little eggs will be hanging by little threads on all the plants. And one time you have to remove her because she will eat them. If she sees them, they're gone. Any other fish sees them, they're gone. So this is a fish that I prefer to spawn in a smaller tank loaded with plants. The water chemistry, they can be between six and seven, they don't even think really <coughs> special. They're not that big of a fish. They're a little over two and a half. When you see them in the store, they're usually a lot smaller, and they're just a drab silver fish. But you gotta take a chance. If you see Cornipoma, anything, just buy it, because they're cool. They're just really cool. <clears throat> so you see the female back here, no elaborate fins, fuller body. Uh, just, this is a really cool fish. This is one of the glandular cottings that Rosario had mentioned. Not a lot of eggs, right? I'm sorry? Not a lot of eggs. Not a lot of eggs. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you're not going to get, yeah, you might get, if the she gets fertilized, you might, you'd be lucky if you get eight, eight eggs at a time. And they might not all pop out on the same day. She might take two or three days to disperse her eggs. This is super cool fish. And you, if you don't do anything with that stupid computer of yours, you got to go home and research glandular colony or just research quarter pound. There are so many really cool articles online because they're doing a lot of research on this fish. Nobody understands. You see that? Looks like he has a little booger stuck on the end of something. And that filament, that filament is actually on both sides of the male, right behind the gill cover. And it's usually flush with his body. He can swim through rapids. He can just sit there and it'll be flush next to his body with that little flag on there. Look at his fins. Just look at that dorsal. That's, that's incredible. And then look at her. She's like, oh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> yeah. He'll pull that from out his side. It's so interesting that that thing looks like it's smaller than fishing line. And he'll just pull that out and wiggle that when he sees a female and he dangles it. And she thinks, oh, look, food. And she goes up and gets right next to him. And you know what his intentions are. Ha ha, I got you right where I want you. He inseminates her while she's biting at that thing. She's fertilized. She swims off her way and he swims off another way. He's waiting for another female. He puts that little flag right back where it came from. They're doing a lot of research now because those things are actually different shapes for different colonies found in different parts of South America. And their, their thinking is that the little appendage resembles whatever food the female is finding to eat. And the male says, oh hey, she's eating a lot of daphnia, I'll make it look like daphnia. Or hey, she's eating a lot of ants, I'll make it look like ants. If it doesn't resemble an ant, at least it's the same color. And she thinks she's got food, and he's thinking wham bam. <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> and, it's just the coolest fish. And you can actually sit your butt down in front of your tank and watch that female swim up and she'll walk in a plant, she'll eh, flip upside down, squirt out an egg, go. It's just so cool to watch. And it's even cooler when you watch them breed. He's dangling that appendage and that's, they call it a flag, in front of her. And she's like, ooh. And he's like, ooh. So it's really cool fish. I hardly ever see this fish available for sale in our area, but every time I do, even though I already spawned it, I grab them because I want to spawn them again. I want to see, I mean, it's, it's just, just so much fun.
They're really cool. And the fry, you can pick them off the plants. If you find the eggs, you can pick them off if you don't re remove the um, carrots. Pick the eggs off, just break the whole leaf off. I don't care about the plants, I care about the fish. Hatch them out in a different container. Again, we have a little silver fish, a little silver sliver of nothing. And in about three days, you start feeding in green water, sponge sponge, and they'll all over the tank. So and they're really simple, simple to raise. And there it is, there's a close up. See? Right there, all done. And there's that little that little fly. And that I think that's so cool. I think that's so neat. And you can see all the little sensory tools all over them. This is a really cool fish. And look, they have a stamp for it. I think that's awesome. <coughs> Colotus or Chilotus punctatus. Um, sometimes fish stores will have these labeled as punctatus when they're really grisalis. Grisalis will have a black <coughs> line always present. Punctatus, it's not. They, they might get that way um, when they're frightened. It, it, it leaves, it, it disappears. This is the head stander. Um, I have this fish, and I have it in a planted tank, and it has never bothered my plants. But I feed it a lot of green stuff. So I feed it, um, Sarah makes a uh, pellet food for, that has spirulina in it. He also makes a, a plankton tablet that I feed them. A lot of green food I feed these guys. They don't get any meat. Um, I don't, I don't know how to sex them in mine, but supposedly the females are obviously larger and heavier body, as, as is typical. This is just a pretty fish, and they're always pointed right down. And mine pick through the sand like little bulldozers they go through. They don't disrupt anything. They don't dislodge plants, rocks, anything, but just little mouthfuls, and they bobble along. They're just a really cool fish. Another one that you hardly ever see. I saw these, and Eric's like, oh, what do you want to buy them for? Well, because I want them, because they're cool, cute and cool. They're just a really neat fish. And they have them, believe it or not, after they've been alive for so long in my tanks, they have some color in the, <clears throat> in the coffin. And the male spins are, dorsal fin is larger, and it gets a lot of beautiful yellows and golds in it with the black flecking. It's a really nice fish. Never spawned, and I don't, I've never read a spawning report on it either. I just want to show it to you because it's something different. And different is always good. Hemigramus aurei, aurei's tetra. I have a group of these hem. I've had them forever. I cannot figure out what to do with these fish to get them to spawn. And again, it's a silver fish. If you see it in a hobby shop, it's just going to be a silver fish with a black line through it and a big gold line midway through the fish, or the top portion of the fish. The little yellow and black caudal spots, both the males and females have, the dorsal fin has black and gold in it. This fish is absolutely stunning. If you see it in real life, if you put it into a tank with plants. I don't know how to spawn it, I wish to God I did because I just love them. And every time I see them, I, I just keep buying more and I want a whole flock of them. But they're really, really cool fish. Extremely peaceful, don't bother each other, don't bother anybody else, don't bother the plants. I put shrimp in the water, they don't care about that shrimp. They will sometimes eat from the bottom. They must have to be pretty hungry. And the only thing they go onto the bottom for is black bars, live black bars. If it's frozen food, they won't touch it. Flake, anything else, they will not touch it. You're such a really cool fish. I'd like to talk to you a little, a little bit about African tetras. I'm gonna to try to talk faster because I think I'm using up all my time. African species, five minutes, no! African species are seldom imported and when you do get imported, they're very, very costly. Why do you think that is, boys and girls? Because who in the hell wants to go to Africa, get kidnapped or killed, just to bring back some fish? So if you see these fish online anymore, they're always very expensive. In my opinion, if you can afford it, always worth the money. So we have the ubiquitous Congo Tetra. There's a kid over there uh, in the vendor's room that says he has Congo Tetras. They are not Congo Tetras. I don't know what they are. Congo Tetras, ubiquitous, easy to spawn, straightforward to spawn. Club a job of moss, some rocks maybe, 
They deposit big eggs, two, three millimeter eggs. They always look like they're opaque and they're bad. Take the eggs out, they will hatch. In 24 hours, that opaque egg is going to turn clear and you will have fry. Fire straightforward, easy to raise. Usually within a couple of days, you can feed them great brunch. Alastapirtirzius McCallie, beautiful fish. The photographs don't do it justice. This fish has a beautiful, beautiful electric blue sheen on the back, lots of fins on the males. Really straightforward, straight RO, warm temperature, lots of food, water changes, boom, you got eggs. Same way with the um, Congo Tetra. They come out, they look white, they look bad. You think, oh no, it didn't work. Take those eggs out, I siphon them out with, along with the Java Moss. Put them in a container, five and a half, two and a half gallon tank. They'll hatch in a couple of days. Take baby Ron and three. There's a picture of my fry. The Gropterus. This is a drop dead gorgeous fish. Lots of color, red, orange, blue, yellow, green. But they're, they're <laughs> it's very beautiful. Males have the elaborate fins, lots of color. Females, silver and drab. Smaller fish. Uh, straight RO water, lots of live food, water changes, same thing again. Put a big patch of java moss or some uh, spawning moss in there. The males and the females court side by side, squirting out eggs. Again, the eggs may look bad. Remove them from the tank into a different container. These are larger fish. The males, including the um, finnage, about three or four inches. Straightforward to breed, straightforward to raise the fry. Very expensive. There's the setup I used for them. That was the first one. Now I just have the job moss, a great big mat of it right here. And that's what they spawn in. And I like to have a lot of cover. All these Congo tetra species seem to be very skittish. So if there's a lot of light from above, they hide. If you walk up to the tank really quickly, they scatter and just dash off the, off the glass. So you gotta be careful with them. There's the egg, there's the egg getting ready to hatch, and then there's the fry. As you can see, again, it's a clear fish. A couple of days, baby brine, they grow like weeds really quickly. Orianticus, this is the lamp icon grow. This is a one that you, it's just been on the market, I think, for maybe the past five, six years. Photograph won't do it justice. It's a beautiful gold, beautiful green, beautiful blue, green, turquoise. It's just a phenomenal fish. And even the females have the color. I haven't spawned this fish yet, but um, Amazonas had a terrific article about Congo tetras. Was that last year? Yeah. I think it was last year, thank you. About last year, fantastic article. A lot of unusual fish that you hardly ever see. They're extremely spawnable. If you can get your hands on some, by all means do. Live food's the condition. Arnold Dectis Philopterus, the red-eyed um, African tetra. This is a tank of uh, fish that I've always wanted to work with ever since I was a little kid. As is typical, as, just like the name, the males and the females have red eyes. Female deeper, male not. Not filthy about food, they'll eat anything. Supposedly I read online that they were easy to spawn. I've never tried it. Um, I haven't kept them since I was in my teens, so. <coughs> another one that you hardly ever see. Brasimus longipinus. Here's another fish you'll see in the shops. And it's just a silver fish with some pretty fins, that nice black mark, gold mark. He might have a little bit of gold on Usually it's silver and pretty drab looking. You think, I don't want to buy that fish for. Yeah. Buy it, take it down, put it in good water. Trust me, you won't be sorry. Beautiful little plant of tank. They actually look like they're glowing silver with a gold back. It's a lovely fish. Straightforward to spawn them. Feed them really well, separate the males and the females, put them together for a couple of days over some java moss and some RO water, you'll get the big eggs, take them to parents out, leave the eggs in situ, start feeding them after the third day, baby brown shrimp, they grow like weeds as well. Latigesia rolofi, sadly this is a fish that hardly ever gets imported anymore, when it does, they might not be in the best condition because they're kind of slim, slim. This is a small fish, uh, less than an inch long, perfect for a nano tank. <coughs> Males and the females, the males are uh, thinner, females plump. The males have an orange hook on the radial fin. Nobody knows what that's for yet. I've never found a breeding report, and I've talked to Hans about it. I don't know anybody that's ever spawned this fish, but it's a fish that we need to um, keep an eye on. Lepidorcus adonis. Has anyone ever seen this in real life? Have you seen one that looked that good? Yes, no, in between? Yeah. <coughs> Most of them come in from the country of Guinea now, and it, they're not as They're not attractive. in good shape, right. They're okay, but right. they're not. Right, right. Yeah. 
This is a beautiful pho photograph by Frank Schaefer from um, Aquarium Blazer in Germany. Guy takes great fish photos. Um, I kept this fish a couple of times. Sadly, I lost them. They are shy. They don't like a lot of other busy fish around them. Beautiful in the planet tank. Again, live foods. They will not eat flake food. Uh, they will eat frozen food. Um, never go to the bottom of the floor of uh, the tank to eat. I don't care what you got down there. Jesus could be down there dancing and handing out uh, Fritos, and he's not going to get out there and eat any of it. So females are just still in a fuller body. The males develop that red flecking on them. This is what you normally see. Barely a hint of freckles on the fish's body. Don't let that be a deterrent. Take it home, put it in soft water, warm water, feed it well. Those spots might not look like Mr. Schaefer's photograph, but they will show up and they are really pretty fish. I don't know anyone that's ever spawned I just want to show it to you because of, I'll show you in a minute. Why I showed you those last few fish. I'm going to get up on a soapbox and I'm going to try to talk quick, which I do awfully. I started to do research on a lot of these fish and all the time you see, you research a fish, you want to make sure you have the correct um, scientists saying after it. So I'm researching. I see all these things on there. IUCN threatened. IUCN vulnerable. 75% of the inland water waves are destroyed. I find that extremely alarming. And you should too. Especially if you have children and grandchildren. I have neither. But I care about your grandchildren and what they're going to face when they get to be our age. 75%. This is old information. We might be trying to rehabilitate or restore or whatever. We're not doing a good job. 83% on average between 1970 and 2014. That's pathetic. How badly do we need all these plastics and all this oil? We don't. We're being lied to. And I don't care whether you like me saying it or not. So the IUCN has a red list. They evaluate, their, their goal is to evaluate every species. That's a hefty goal, hefty. But I have faith and confidence that they will be able to do that. So they have nine categories, extinct, extinct in the wild, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, near threatened, um, least concerned, data deficient, not evaluated. I'm sorry, Regina, it's about four of them. Wasn't it about two? Oh, just <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I just want you to be aware that a lot of the species that we're keeping, they're listed as vulnerable. Great place to uh, find information, CARES, National Geographic, IUCN. There's species on here that we're keeping in our tanks that we should be working diligently to preserve. So if you can get your hand on some of these fish, because I'm sure that there are others, get your hand on them. So save a fish. Please try, Tedra. Thank you.